Okay, so if, as a first example, we're going to cover um, an example of non-dominance. Uh, so a lot of the rules are the same, uh, with the exception that the way two alleles interact um, in a heterozygote can be a little bit different. And so these are uh, best ex uh, common example is a four o'clock flower. So these are flowers, and the petals have different colors, red and white. Um, so the first thing to note is that these um, flowers right here are um, breeding true, so they're homozygous, and so we um, and they're controlled by a single gene. Uh, so we have given the alleles um, that are responsible for this trait difference two names. Um, so CR is the name for the allele that controls red, and CW is the allele that controls white. Um, so each of these is homozygous. And so all we're going to do is a monohybrid style cross um, where we cross two parents together, create an F1, and then we intercross to see what happens. And so when we do this for these flowers, one of the first things um, that we get is a surprise in the F1 generation. Um, so in the F1 generation, the flowers are pink. And so this almost looks like blending inheritance that you know, is thought to be the case before Mendel. Um, and it's a, it's a phenotype, it's a trait that is in between um, the traits of the two parents. So if you take red and you mix it with white, you know, the expected color is pink. And so this was observed in the F1 generation. And then if you intercross these, um, if you're dealing with a monohybrid cross in the previous chapter, you'd expect to get a three to one ratio for the phenotypes. But here we get a one to two to one ratio instead. So we see red, pink, and white. So we see three categories um, of, of colors uh, and the ratio is, is now one to two to one. And so the one to two to one, that hopefully reminds you of the genotype ratio um, that we saw before. You know, there's one uh, homozygote, two heterozygotes, and then one of the, um, of the uh, recessive homozygote. And so in Mendel's chapters, we group these two together to get a three to one phenotype. And so what happens if there's not dominance? Um, this is what happens. So, so in this case, the reason we have a pink color is because the heterozygote actually has a mixture um, of colors. And so when we do this cross, um, you know, the, the, as, as normal we always do, we figure out which gametes can be produced by this F1 individual. And now there's two different gametes that can be produced, a CR and a CW. And so since it's an intercross, that also forms the other side of the square. And so then if we complete this Punnett square, we see that one of the square will be this, two of the offspring will be heterozygote, and then one of the offspring will be homozygous for the white allele. And so this is where the one to two to one ratio comes from because these alleles interact in a different way um, where now the heterozygote genotype can be distinguished from the homozygote genotypes. And this again is an example of um, incomplete dominance where each um, allele expresses part of its trait um, resulting in a blending of phenotypes in the heterozygote. Um, so if, 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 it, if uh, this again is a red um, parental flower and a white parental flower um, and incomplete dominance is pink, um, there's another category of interaction called codominance. Um, so codominance is when both parental colors are actually expressed in the heterozygote individual. So flowers is a good way to kind of distinguish between these two different categories. Incomplete dominance, the blend between red and white is pink, um, but a codominant phenotype indicates that both the red and the white color can be seen in the F1. Um, so it's important to remember that codominance means that the actual parental phenotype can be seen in that, in that heterozygote individual. So geneticists use symbols for alleles. Um, dominant alleles are indicated by either an italic uppercase letter um, or in some cases a group of letters with a plus superscript or sometimes just a plus. Um, traditionally these, this designation is used by people that work in Drosophila uh, Drosophila is a very popular model organism where a lot of fundamental um, rules of genetics was also discovered after Mendel. Um, a recessive allele is indicated either by an italic lower letter, D, 
um, or a group of letters without a plus. So some examples of this from Drosophila melanogaster, um, body color. Um, so ebony is a mutant um, body color phenotype. So the normal wild type color of flies is gray, um, but mutants have been identified that have an ebony body color. And the gene um, and the allele for that is specified by this, this E right here. So the wild type allele is specified by the E, e plus um, symbol. And that also indicates that it's the dominant, uh, that, that, that's the dominant allele. So we're switching back to dominance and recessiveness just for a moment to talk about this stuff. Um, so gray homozygote, gray heterozygote, and then ebony homozygote. And so you'll often see this as E plus over E plus. The heterozygote is E plus over E because the plus is dominant. Um, it's gray. And then the E, e is the homozygous recessive. Um, sometimes you'll also see it listed as this. So instead of even listing the gene, you simply just list it as a plus. So this is even like less work to write down the, down the allele. Um, so plus plus um, is a gray homozygote, plus E is a heterozygote, and then the E is the homozygote recessive that actually has the, the mutant, the mutant um, body color. All right, there are also examples of situation where there's more than one allele um, for a given gene. Um, so in Mendel's case, there was only two. Um, you know, there was a dominant allele, A, there was a recessive allele, little a, um, but there's only two possible copies that you can have. Um, in the previous case, we saw that there was two alleles. There was a red and a white allele that controlled flower petal color, um, so you only could have two different options. So now we're going to move to the case of rabbits um, and the color of the rabbit fur, um, where it is actually controlled by four different alleles. Um, so the allele names are, are specified um, as capital C, um, C, CH for chinchilla, CH for Himalayan, and then just little c. And if you look at the homozygote individuals for all four of these alleles, these are the colors of the fur that you would observe. Um, so the wild type rabbits have a brown fur. The chinchillas are black tipped um, with a little bit of white fur. The Himalayan is primarily white fur, but black um, paws, nose, ears, and tails. And then finally the albino just is all white. Um, and so if you knew the genotype, um, you, would, uh, you would be able to predict the color of the, of the Himalayan rabbit. Um, of course, you can have mixtures um, of alleles as well, so because they're diploids, um, each individual can have two of these four alleles. So the maximum amount of alleles that we can have of these four um, are just two, but you could have any sort of combination. So uh, the C over C chinchilla, um, you can have the C with the CH, the Himalayan, the C with the C, etc. So there's a total um, of eight different combinations that you can have. And so now if you want to know the colors of those heterozygote individuals, you would have to know the dominance recessiveness relationship or um, potentially the co-dominance, um, incomplete dominance recessive relationship for every single allele pair. And so for this particular case, it's dominant and recessive. And so this just shows the fact that this C plus allele is dominant to every single other of the three alleles. So as long as you have one copy of the capital C allele, um, it could be homozygote, it can be paired with a chinchilla, it could be paired with the Himalayan, or it could be paired with the albino allele. It doesn't matter. In all cases, this is dominant and results in a wild-type rabbit with brown fur. Chinchilla, um, that is basically um, next in line in the hierarchy. So it is dominant to the Himalayan and the albino. Um, so if you're a homozygote or if you're matched with either the Himalayan or the, or the albino, you still have black tip fur and you'd be a chinchilla colored rabbit. Himalayan is only dominant to albino, so these are the only two genotype combinations that can result in that. And then um, the albino is dominant to nothing, and so the only way you can have that is if it's, if it's um, both uh, homozygous uh, for both the albino or the else. So this is an example of multiple alleles. Four of the same gene are found in rabbits. Just remember these alleles still interact in a dominant recessive fashion. So the number of alleles um, is, different from the, uh, is different from the relationship um, between the alleles. So when we talked about petal color, you know, that was where we changed the recessive dominance. 
Here we're leaving recessive dominance alone, which is inc increasing the number of alleles to four. So let's say we wanted to do a cross um, between uh, chinchilla rabbits and Himalayan rabbits, and I told you they bred true. Um, so you know that they're homozygous um, for the chinchilla alleles and they're homozygous for the Himalayan alleles. So if we did a cross, this particular rabbit could only give you one gamete. This rabbit could only give you one gamete. And so you know the F1 genotype with certainty is going to be heterozygote um, with these two alleles. And then just kind of, you know, we, we, as we talked about before, chinchilla is dominant over Himalayan, and so the phenotype of these animals would be chinchilla. Now let's say we intercross these. So if we intercross these, um, this F1 can produce two different gametes. So again, you'd have to do your Punnett square with four different squares, two sides to each square, and then you would have a total of three different genotypes that occur. This genotype would be uh, chinchilla, this genotype would be chinchilla, and then this genotype would be Himalayan. And so in a lot of ways, this, this particular cross would look exactly the same as the monohybrid crosses that we saw in the previous, um, in the previous chapter. So you'd have a one, two to one genotype ratio, and then you'd have a three to one genotype ratio. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but when you look into the, into the heterozygotes, um, you know, things can be a little bit different. So for example, if you took a chinchilla rabbit and crossed it to a Himalayan rabbit, um, but these animals did not breed true, and these were actually heterozygotes, then you know, the crosses would look a little bit different. So this chinchilla animal um, could be crossed to this Himalayan animal. Both of them are heterozygote, uh, but now you have a total of three, um, three different alleles uh, to worry about. And so if you did a cross, again, you would basically just have to do the Punnett square to figure out kind of what goes on. Um, so uh, this individual, the chinchilla individual, would produce two gametes. The Himalayan individual would produce two different gametes. And now if you, you combine them together, you know, this is what you get. So um, these two genotypes, even though they're different, would produce the same color, so both of these would be Himalayan, and then these two individuals would also produce the same color, um, chinchilla, and so the F1 ratio would be, um, would be one to one. And we're not even going to try to do the F2 just because now we, then we would have to deal with four different genotypes to intercross, which would be a very complicated cross. All right, so another example of um, a trait that has uh, multiple alleles and now we're also going to in introduce um, the possibility of codominance occurring um, at the same time is actually blood groups. So human ABO blood groups. Um, you know, so hopefully or, or, you, know, you might know your, your blood test. You know, it's important if you ever get a blood transfusion um, to know your blood type um, because if you get the wrong blood type, um, then you know, you serious medical consequences to that. Um, recently, it's been in the news for COVID-19, um, and it's thought that there's a protective role for your blood type on, on your susceptibility for, um, for COVID-19. And so A seems to be more susceptible um, to, to COVID infections, and O seems to be less susceptible, and then B seems to be kind of in the middle. Um, these are just, um, it's important to remember that these are just probabilities, um, you know, People with an O type can still die of COVID. People with an A type um, uh, can still be fine. You know, it's just a subtle effect um, on, on, on how bad the disease can be. Um, so what exactly is your blood type? And um, these genes, what they're doing is they're controlling the presence or absence of certain antigens on the surface of your red blood cells. Um, and there are three different alleles to worry about um, of a single gene and that are responsible for the ABO blood type. So first let's talk about the phenotype. So this is kind of a strange phenotype and this kind of, you're gonna to have to think a little bit outside the box. So previously we've always talked about phenotypes as something you visually look at for an organism. Um, so you know the, the size of the pea plant, the color of the seed, um, the color of the, of the flower petal. Uh, but in this case, the, the the phenotype is actually your blood type. So your blood type can be one of four different categories, A, 
B, A, B, and O. And if I look around at you, um, or if you look at me, obviously you have no idea what my blood type. You'd actually have to do a laboratory test in order to do that, or even an at-home test. So you could order a test where you do a little um, prick of your finger in order to um, get a drop of blood, and then that blood drop can tell you, if you put it on a piece of paper, it can tell you what exactly your blood type is. And so the way it works is it tries to determine um, the presence of certain antibodies in your plasma. So um, circulating in your blood are antibodies, and these antibodies can recognize and um, coagulate around the presence of certain antigens. And so it's a bit confusing. If your blood type is A, that means that you have the A antigen, which is recognized by the antibody. So this is an antibody that recognizes an antigen. Um, and, this, and this red blood cell is displaying this um, on, on the outside surface of the blood cell. Because you have this circulating in your blood, these antibodies are cleared um, from your plasma. So you do not have antibodies that recognize the A antigen. Instead, you have antigens that recognize the B antigen because that is not present upon the red blood cell. Similarly, if you have a B blood type, you, um, you express the B antigen on the surface of the red blood cells, and then you have antibodies to the anti-A, um, so antibodies that recognize the A antigen circulating from your blood. So your body clears the antibodies um, so that, the, you know, this would be very bad if, if your body recognized your um, blood cell, your, your blood cells, um, because they would think of it as an infection or a foreign object of some sort, or a foreign material of some sort. AB, that means that you actually produce both of these antigens. So you both have, have A and B on the presence of your red blood cells. And so because of that, you've cleared out all of the antibodies from your plasma, and you don't have antibodies either A or B. And then if you're O, that means that you don't produce any of the antigens, and so your blood uh, basically contains both of the antibodies. And so this is why uh, there's a universal donor, and there's also a universal acceptor. So if you're the universal donor, that means you're the O type. Um, so if you give blood, you provide blood cells that doesn't have any sort of antigen. So anyone that, take, that has O blood cells in their body, these antibodies are not going to be able to recognize anything because there's no antigen on the surface of the blood cells. In contrast, the AB is the universal acceptor because they can accept any four of these blood types. So they don't have any sort of antibodies actually um, going through their blood. And so these antibodies aren't present in order to recognize anything on the surface of the blood cells. So it doesn't really matter what sort of blood you give a person with AB because of that. In contrast, if you look at someone like an O, and if you took um, AB blood and gave it to an O individual, um, then they would have a problem because that blood would have this antigen on the surface and now all of these antibodies that are going in the liquid parts of your blood are able to bind to and recognize these red blood cells, and that's going to cause problems. So this, again, is just the phenotype, and it's just whether or not your, your blood contains antibodies, um, that uh, whether or not your blood contains antibodies um, that would recognize these different blood cells. Confusing, but just try to try to come back to this and remember that this is what, what, it, what the phenotype is. So what exactly are these antigens? Um, so they're carbohydrate groups that are bound to lipid groups on red blood cells. Um, and it's also, there's also a substance called H substance um, uh, that is present um, on blood cells as well. So um, even the O type has this additional H substance kind of cir circulating on top of it. So, you know, if you get into biochemistry, you know, you might be interested in understanding exactly, uh, you know, what the carbohydrate groups, the molecules that are bound to it. Uh, but, you know, these are just unique molecules that an antibody can actually, uh, you can uh, develop antibodies that, that, that recognize these things. So how are these things controlled? What is the genetic basis? So there's a gene, the I gene, um, isoagglutinogen, um, and that gene has three particular alleles. And so one of the alleles is named IA, capital IA. One of the alleles is 
is I B, and one of these alleles is um, little i. And the purpose of this naming scheme is to help you remember the relationships between the different alleles. So if you want to produce this antigen, you have to be able to have, so if you want to produce the A antigen, you have to have the IA allele. If you want to produce the IB, sorry, the B antigen, you have to have the IB allele. And if you produce both the A and the B, um, you produce both. I allele does not produce, the little i allele does not produce any antigen. Now this is where the relationships come in. So again, the relationship has to be determined between any two pairs of, of alleles. So in this case, there are one, two, three different combinations to worry about. So you can compare, you can pair IA with B, you can pair IA with little i, and you compare IB with little i. And so in this case, A is dominant to I, little i, and B is dominant to little i. But then we also have this situation where if we look at the, the relationship between IA and IB, in this case, they're actually co-dominant to each other. And so what does that mean? So let's list all of the possible genotypes. Um, so we have the homozygotes, and kind of as expected, you produce the A antigen if you are IA homozygote and your phenotype is A, so you have an A blood type. Again, if you're homozygote for the B, you produce the B, you have a B blood type. Um, and then if you're little i, little i, you produce neither, and then you have an O blood type. So what happens if you are a heterozygote for IA little i? So again, what we said before was that this allele is dominant to this allele, and so you produce the A antigen, and so again, you just have the A, A phenotype, so you have an A blood type in this case. Similarly, if you're heterozygote in this case, IB is dominant to little i, so your phenotype you know, is the same as this case right here, so your B, and just note that these two phenotypes are identical to each other. But if you're IA, IB in this case, this is an example of codominance um, because the antigens that are produced, you produce both A and B, and so your blood type is a combination of both. You're both A and B. And so this is an I, A, B blood type. That means that you're heterozygote. All right, so there's an activity on, on as part of your activity, we're going to go in a lot more detail um, going through the blood type. This is just kind of like, like a very useful thing you can do uh, from your genetics class. All right, so one final situation, um, and this, again, one gene, one allele, or sorry, two alleles, but now we have a special situation where one of the combination results in dead animals. Um, so, uh, we have a mouse that has a specific fur color, um, and if you have, so the two alleles are listed here, big A and then AY, and so if you're homozygote um, for the big A, then you have an agouti coat color, it's called agouti. If you're heterozygote for the two alleles, then you have a yellow coat color, and if you have homozygote for the, a, the AY, then you actually die. Um, so this mouse will die. And this mouse actually dies very early on. You know, it dies while it's in the uterus. So it's not something that the mouse is born and then you see it dead, or the mouse is born and then dies. Um, you actually never see the mouse, uh, the, the mouse pup, um, uh, because it dies so early in development. And so what happens if you took two yellow coat individuals and cross them to each other? So if you have, you know, an AY, And you cross this to another individual with a y. So in general, um, the genotype ratios that you hopefully would be able to tell me right away are one to two to one. So this individual produced two gametes, this individual produced two gametes, and then if you do the Punnett square, you'd have you know one homozygote for one allele, you two with the heterozygotes, and then one homozygote for the other allele. 
but in, and, and you would consequently have some sort of phenotypic ratio of one to two to one. So what about in this case? So in this case, um, again, you have this individual produced, this individual produced, this individual produced, but this individual is dead. And so similarly to chapter two, um, where we are talking about pedigrees, you again have to renormalize probabilities. So um, the total is no longer one quarter plus one quarter plus one quarter plus one quarter equals one, but if you add it all up together, you get three quarters. And so your chance in this cross of having an agouti individual would be one quarter divided by three quarters. So instead of being one quarter, it would be one third. And then similarly, if you do yellow, um, it would be two thirds. So one third, two third ratios, whenever you see something like that, um, you should always be thinking to yourself, maybe something lethal is going on um, because that's a very common way to get, to get that sort of ratio. All right, uh, so that is the extent of part one, and now I will go into part two.